Good morning, I'm Ken Stevens, and we're pleased to put on this program as part of Adult Ed this morning. And I'm going to give a little introduction to our speaker, even though everybody in the place probably knows her. But uh, ordinarily, we wouldn't do that with a pastor, but uh, Nancy's relatively new here, and I'm not sure everybody knows what kind of a Renaissance woman she is. Uh, Nancy has was a graduate of Swarthmore and the Harvard Divinity School. And listen to this diversity. She's held a philanthropic post with Austin Theological Seminary. She's been a university chaplain. She's been an associate pastor elsewhere. And she ter served a term as a policy wonk with the, uh, the policy arm of PCUSA. Uh, she's written quite a bit, and she's an educator. And uh, personally, let me add this, if you're drafting a charades or trivial pursuit team, you want to trade up for Nancy. <laughs> She's really something. So before turning it over, can we pray for a moment? Please pray with me. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together in your name. Thank you for the opportunity to reflect on the sacraments that you initiated and gifted to us. Bless Nancy in her teaching this morning. Bless us in our listening. And be with us and inspire us with a curiosity and a sense of wonder. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, sibling and friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. So. And, and thank you, Sister Jaina. <laughs> and thank you, everybody. Both those who are gathered here before me in this stage and those who are actually that's awkward because those of you online can't tell that I'm gesturing to I am gesturing to the to you over on our screen and so we're glad to see all of you here this morning if you are here expecting to learn more about the two sacraments that are recognized in our tradition, the first of which we will be diving deeply into the realm of baptism get it, uh, then you have come to the right place. We are going to be spending our time together exploring the sacrament of baptism. We are going to consider it in the context of our worship, but we're also going to uh, consider the history uh, and, and the theology of baptism as well. Before I launch into the formal presentation itself, just out of curiosity, um, if you wish to indicate by show of hands, if you're comfortable, how many were baptized as infants if you have been baptized? Okay, so the house tends to uh, favor those who have been uh, baptized as infants. How about as uh, a child or an adult? Any among here? Okay, ah, a fairly good assortment of those who have been baptized uh, as uh, older than an infant. And uh, anybody who hasn't yet been baptized but is seeking to learn more about how to do so, please feel free to visit with me or any one of the other pastors afterwards, and we'll be able to, we'll be happy to walk you through that journey. But it's a fair thing to say that probably some of this will offer some refreshment and new knowledge, given that the vast majority of us can't remember our baptisms. So I am going to pivot here to show my screen. So here we are gathered to learn more about baptism. And so essentially we'll begin by the pressing question, what exactly is a sacrament to begin with? And for those of you who may recall having walked through this lesson, either in confirmation class for some of you, or pre perhaps in new member, member classes, or if you have been an ordained officer in those training days, this is a bit of a refresher. Um, but a sacrament essentially within our tradition is the word of God enacted and sealed in the life of the church, the body of Christ. So it's an act, 
and it is a demonstration of God's work in our midst, and it seals us in the covenant uh, of God's love and care for us, and we'll consider the word covenant in just a moment, but it seals us together as a body of Christ. It's a gracious act of God, both of the sacraments, the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of communion, by which Jesus Christ offers his life to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So right off the top, we're met by the triune God, that is God in three forms or persons, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit key components um, as a part of our understanding of the sacraments. On the human side, there are also human acts of gratitude by which we offer our lives to God in love and in service. So the sacraments are signs and seals both of God's relationship with us, but it is also our opportunity to affirm or be entered into or to reaffirm our faithful response of discipleship following Jesus Christ. And as both our, both baptism and the Lord's Supper are physical signs and spiritual gifts, we already said that they include words and actions, they are surrounded by prayer. There is always some sort of prayer going on in the context of the church's common worship. And these words will be important, as we'll see later as well. Uh, for those who gathered with us this morning, we had the delight of experiencing baptism. Uh, so that's a great primer for entering into our reflection this morning. Uh, the sacraments and baptism, specifically today, employ ordinary things. It's a bapt uh, baptism and communion both offer opportunities for us to experience the extraordinary in the midst of the ordinary. God works through God's creation, ever leaning into his creation to deepen her relationship with us. So basic elements of water of bread, of wine or grape drink, uh, fruit of the grape and grain, the things by which we bathe and into which we float. They are exemplary ways for God to convey God's extraordinary power through ordinary things and that nothing escapes the scope and expanse of God's presence uh, and God's partnership with us. Now, narrowing more deeply into the Reformed tradition, uh, I keep referring to the two sacraments, the two sacraments. Uh, it's because Protestants and Presbyterians recognize two. Uh, do we have uh, anybody who has come from a Roman Catholic background prior to Presbyterianism? Not present, but actually a good number of uh, our siblings in Christ that are a part of Forth have come from a Roman Catholic tradition or perhaps a uh, Greek or other form of Orthodox uh, tradition in terms of Eastern Christianity. The Roman Catholic Church recognizes seven sacraments. Uh, which we would, we would look at some things that are regarded in the Roman Catholic Church um, as sacraments, such as uh, marriage. Um, of course, we include baptism and communion, but the other extreme unction is uh, that's last uh, rites, uh, which is another one of the seven. But what are all uh, commended as sacraments in the Roman Catholic tradition, often we name as covenants. So all of these other acts of discipleship, of relationship that we honor and celebrate in the life and witness of the church, like marriage, is a covenant, um, but not uh, what we would regard as a sacrament. And the two sacraments that we recognize are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Why? Uh, 
Well, primarily for two reasons. Because they have been instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ in scripture, in the gospels, and we'll look at the scriptures uh, also as a part of our exploration today. But uh, essentially they're commended by Jesus Christ through the witness of the scriptures and specifically the gospels and sustained throughout the history of the universal church. So the acts of the sacrament of baptism and communion have always been a part of how we have understood our common life as Christian community, as the body of Christ together. And essentially, we do these two things, baptism and communion, because uh, Christ told us to, or Christ told his disciples to. Now, side note, there are a number of things that Christ actually commands the disciples to do as well. And for a variety of reasons have not risen in Protestant regard to the act of, to the, to the category of sacrament. Uh, for those of us who have been journeying through uh, the path of discipleship, uh, we have explored uh, foot washing last week, as if you look at the scripture and what Jesus tells his disciples to do, he does command foot washing as well, but it has escaped the realm of uh, sacramental life for us as Christians. Feel free to ponder on that uh, of your own accord. So baptism acts as a seal and sign of our incorporation into Jesus Christ. And the Book of Order, which is an essential text from which uh, the majority of my uh, comments come today, uh, really explores with beautiful language the significance theological and otherwise of baptism. But pointing out what it says about what it means that we practice baptism in the church. What we are doing is dying and rising with Jesus Christ. We uh, join Jesus in common life. We are uh, joined with him when he engages his public ministry. And that first act of public ministry is to be baptized. And so we also walk through the journey with Christ unto death. And so we die with Christ and we rise with Jesus Christ through the act of baptism. Baptism gives us a sense of the pardon, the cleansing and renewal through the Holy Spirit as God's grace in our lives. The gift of the Holy Spirit to allow for the pardoning, cleansing and renewal. The incorporation once again into the body of Christ and as a sign of the kingdom or realm of God in our midst. And again, this word covenant, which is like an agreement or a treaty, this is seen as a sign of God's covenant relationship with us. And the waters of baptism linked with the waters of creation, of the flood, of the exodus, God in, employs powerful um, metaphors uh, that become enactments in human experience uh, through which God speaks and water is essential. Out of chaos, God spoke and the world was formed, but it started in the water. A sign of God's gracious covenant with the church washing the church of what makes it, some people are, have a hard time using the word impure, uh, but really it washes away what would um, weigh down or burden um, or besmirch uh, the church. Those things that would, it washes away the obstacles that we would experience uh, in relationship to God, making it holy and whole 
Also, and it's important to note because I don't think we always think about baptism uh, as an important signpost of this, but baptism represents God's call to justice and righteousness. Remembering the words from uh, the prophet Amos, rolling down like a mighty stream and the river of the water of life that flows from the throne of God, reference to the book of Revelation. So really from Alpha to Omega, beginning to end, water is an important symbol uh, of God's power and of our relationship with God. And essentially, baptism marks the beginning of new life in Christ. So we are made new and constantly renewed as we witness baptism in the life of our common witness here as the church. And through those occasions are called to remember our own baptisms. There are those who may have been present when we were baptized who could actually remember for us on our behalf, but our ritual enactment gives us a sense of a more broad, almost cosmic memory when we remember our baptism and are connected to the saints across time and space. Now, some people may be wondering whether there's, you know, we've talked about how important, how essential baptism, its ties to water, it's the essence of water in the midst of creation and, and, and how long uh, our sense of the scope of time in relationship to water and God uh, there is for us through the sacrament. May be wondering, well, what are the antecedents in the Hebrew scriptures? Where in the Old Testament, you know, were the Jews baptizing uh, one another and did we uh, incorporate this as a practice? Well, the short answer is no. <laughs> Baptism as such, as we have come to understand it, was not a practice that held um, religious significance in the way that we understand it as Christians. But it is prefigured in some aspects uh, of uh, practice of ancient uh, practice. And uh, I've listed a couple of those there. Um, the mikvah or ritual bath. The mikvah was used for various purification rituals. One of the common themes here of how water came into play uh, in uh, religious expression, uh, ritual expression uh, in the Hebrew scriptures is as a, a symbol of purification. So it involved the full immersion into the body of water, like a natural spring or a river or a man-made pool. And it was important for cleansing from various forms of impurity. Impurities related to common bodily realities and functions such as menstruation, childbirth, or contact with a corpse. Now, we'd be reluctant to group all of those aspects of human experience in one fell swoop today. Thanks be to God for that awakening. But, you know, as uh, ancient, ancient traditions and cultures for a variety of reasons um, held those uh, in trust, primarily or it together, uh, primarily because of the lack of uh, resources that had been present at the time to sterilize and, and keep um, they, people um, and food and other things safe. You get an emphasis on those. The cleansing of leprosy in Leviticus and a lot of what we, where we get our information about cleansing rituals uh, in uh, ancient Israel uh, comes from uh, the book of Leviticus, the law. Um, if anybody, you know, perhaps a, dare I say this? Yes, I think God would allow me to say in this day and age that if your Ambien or melatonin or other sleep aids may not be helpful in terms of helping you overcome insomnia, crack open the book of Leviticus. <laughs> Now, no judgment if you find it really exciting. Some people love to see chapters of litanies of, and actually, truth be told, there is some meaty information, you know, some, some juicy tidbits, the tea, if you will, as the children might say, uh, to be found in Leviticus, but a lot of it is just dry legal 
uh, dictates. So um, I commend it to you as you will. But uh, there are detailed instructions for the cleansing of those with leprosy. Uh, and this also involved ritual immersion along with various subst other substances, sometimes used along with water, uh, such as blood or oil, as well as sacrifices. Um, you have a cleansing from discharges, some of which was mentioned beforehand, but Leviticus uh, 15 outlines the rituals for those dealing uh, with various bodily discharges um, and were often uh, involved washing wa with water and waiting for a prescribed period of time before being considered ritually pure. And finally, um, as preparation for priestly service, perhaps we the the, the most uh, prescient way we invoke this today in our, our in our life of worship, those of us in worship leadership, is uh, the hand sanitation. I mean, one might kind of uh, reimagine hand sanitation as as an extension of um, purification before God, uh, but before priests could perform their duties in the tablet or the temple, they were required to undergo a purification process, which often included washing with water. We're pleased to say that we shower regularly and every, every Sunday morning before entry. So these were not just functional practices uh, for the sake of it, but these practices also had religious and symbolic significance, uh, emphasizing the need for moral and spiritual purity before approaching God. So they were imbued with a sense of meaning and purpose, but of course, again, they don't carry the same sensibility or call to discipleship or presence of Jesus uh, that we have in mind when we think of of baptism uh, in our own time. So moving right along here. Ah, here's where we get to scripture. And so, of course, uh, the precedent for our receiving baptism comes to us uh, from Jesus. Uh, and here's, here's a little uh, Bible study nerd fact. Um, how many of you know that not every story, illustration, or parable appears consistently throughout all four Gospels. I see, yeah, yeah, I see some heads nodding. So there are, each one of the Gospels, uh, while it's incredible uh, how much in harmony they are, uh, they are also distinct. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Tune into an intro to Old Testament or New Testament Bible study class for more information on that. <laughs> However, that will let that be a teaser for that opportunity. But before us, we have um, one of uh, the occasions in which each one of the four Gospels has something to say about Jesus's baptism. Uh, and uh, just for the sake of it, the three that we see here, Matthew, Mark and Luke, there's no significance to the nature of the colors. It's just to aid in reading. Uh, but these three are known as the synoptic gospels from the Greek meaning to see with essentially. And they tend to be in common agreement in terms of the details and the pericopes or passages within the gospels that are uh, of the same. Uh, and it's believed that they all uh, were resourced by a document that is not available to us, but something that's called quell or Q, which is from the German word source. So we believe that Matthew, Mark, and Luke took from quell to incorporate those accounts of Jesus in their gospels. Uh, and then John stands out wholly different. John was uh, written much later than the synoptic gospels. And John takes on a theological tone that uh, betrays a more developed sense of uh, Jesus followers at that time. So you get a lot more theology. You get Jesus giving long discourses. But uh, two things that I'll point out here, of course we have Jesus undergoing baptism and uh, we notice that the Holy Spirit 
um, is present or the spirit of God in all of them. In Matthew's gospel, it's verse 17, the moment heaven was open and he saw a spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. We have uh, a dove uh, descending in verse 10 of uh, Mark's passage uh, where he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. Luke, we've got the same thing, Holy Spirit descending on him in bodily form like a dove. And even with John, and in the Gospel of John, we have John's perspective on what happened with Jesus. Um, John gave, the, verse 32, then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Uh, so we have that as a common theme, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here's something that's interesting to note that's different. Um, if we look at Matthew's gospel and uh, verse 17 here, it says, a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Uh, at this point, we have Jesus and John the, uh, John the Baptist as the two main figures here in Matthew. In Mark's gospel, we have... Uh, something a bit different. You've got Jesus coming to be baptized by John, uh, but then instead of this voice saying, this is, we've got, you are my son whom I love with you, I'm well pleased. We have in Luke's gospel. Now in the beginning, we see that there's a crowd of people that are being baptized and Jesus uh, engaging in baptism as well. And we have a voice from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love. And then in John's gospel, uh, we have a voice speaking to John. In verse 33, my, I myself did not know, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, does anyone have any thoughts as to what might be of interest or significant about those differences? What's implied by, some, by the gospel that says, this is or you are? Yes, say more about that. As theology, oh. I'm sorry, I said, can, is this working? Yes, yeah. it okay. is. Okay, I, was, I said intimacy, I yeah. shouted it out. Um, because um, d d it's a development of a theology mm -hmm. during, the, during the years d d um, that people were, there were more and more Christians and mm -hmm. they were able to explain things a little more deeply, I think. Mm -hmm. But while I had this, Nancy, I have another question. Uh, yes. And that is, in anticipation of today, I looked at these passages and something hit me that I'd not ever thought about before. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, how does this compare to the spirit as in the wind spirit mm -hmm. in the Old Testament? Did you have that? I mean, am I blowing your your deck here by asking you that question? No, the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the Spirit takes on, there's the New Testament, pneuma, or panevma, as I, because the pronunciation, I won't nerd out that way. <laughs> but pneuma, the word for spirit in, in the New Testament, uh, there are a number, there are a couple of different renderings of the sense of spirit uh, in the gospels or other portions of the New Testament. And you have the presence of the pneuma being essentially what we come to understand as a dimension of God in three persons. Side note, the Trinity as such is never mentioned in the New Testament. The, the, the formula of the Trinity is something that we have come up with to describe, and we feel that the Testaments, uh, that the, the Bible attests to that, but it's not something in the Bible, um, as in, you know, uh, 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 doctrine, of the, the Trinity. Uh, so aside from that, um, in the Old Testament, you have present at creation, um, Ruach, which is the spirit, uh, and that sense of, you know, holy wisdom <laughs> uh, being a part of uh, creation. The Ruach in uh, the Hebrew scriptures uh, is often imagined in feminine 
form as the embodiment of wisdom. And so, you know, I had there are different conversations in uh, the interpretation or the significance of the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, at Jesus's baptism. I would just suffice it to say that I think the full essence of God in spirit is present to uh, anoint Jesus, if that's helpful, sure. Um, so yes, and all of those, uh, uh, thank you, Anne, all of those observations are uh, valid. Um, another aspect of the distinction between the you and with whom is is Jesus receiving this anointing and is it a private, you are my son with whom I am well pleased? Is it just Jesus who is experiencing this uh, spectacle, this miracle, if you will, or is it the public? This is my son. Everybody see, no. You know, we have a sense from the scriptures, you know, that this is something that was recognized by other people. And certainly John's gospel, at the very least, John sees and knows what's happening. And so it's, if, if, if we delve into the question of, well, which one's right or which one's accurate, the answer is yes. <laughs> they are, they all are speaking to some essential dimension, but with different priorities and in different ways where they differ. But for the sake of the church, that communal sense of this one being anointed is important because it is in the context of community that we uh, experience and practice baptism. Yes, Marilyn. This is probably a totally ridiculous question, but first of all, um, according to the Jewish tradition, to undergo mikvah, mm -hmm. you would would it it would be undertaken by a rabbi? No, uh, a, a, priest, a priest, or or a, yeah, a, a priest would be would would set the parameters for the experience of the mikvah, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be solely priests who would practice it. Or the Bible it. gives no indication about John's background and his authority to do baptisms. That's Other than being anointed as a prophet in the wilderness, <laughs> in the line of the of the prophets. But uh, yes, we just we we trust on the witness of the Gospels that John the Baptist, having been conceived by uh, Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, has also been given the gift of prophecy to point to the coming of the Messiah. The second question is, why does, why does Jesus have to be baptized since he is pure? Excellent question. <laughs> and no, I will disagree with you. Those were not ridiculous questions. <laughs> they were excellent questions. Um, why would Jesus have to under, anybody hazard a guess or have any thoughts as to why Jesus would Here's an area where there is not necessarily a wrong answer because nobody really knows essentially why. We just know that Jesus does. But we have some good theology um, or theological reasoning for why Jesus may have decided to undergo baptism. One, of course, is the nature of the incarnation itself. Uh, Jesus being uh, the word made flesh, human to dwell among us. So, uh, embodiment, literally as an act of solidarity with humankind, you have Jesus taking on the bodily form and therefore perhaps engaging in baptism as a sign of solidarity, simply put, with humanity. There are those who have uh, argued that Jesus, though himself without sin, in taking on the sins of the world, actually bears that sense of sinfulness from which to be cleansed, and so undergoes the act of baptism. Uh, some would say that Jesus engages in it as a teaching, as a, as, you know, for pedagogical reasons, to demonstrate how, what one must do to be um, a faithful disciple 
of Jesus. So those are some of uh, the reasons that people have speculated over the centuries as to why Jesus might have uh, undergone baptism himself. Uh, did he need it? Does Jesus need anything? Who's to say? <laughs> But why we do bat why do we even bother with baptism in the first place? Why do we even do it? Um, well, because the Bible tells us so, like the uh, old Sunday school song says. Uh, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, we come across this thing called the Great Commission. And, you know, there are some churches and places that are very uh, aware and well-rooted in the sense of what the Great Commission involves. Um, you'll hear some of us, you know, among the pastoral staff toss out this phrase. And um, it wouldn't be, you won't be unique if you're thinking, well, I've never, I don't even know what the great commandment or the great commission is what well here it is it's in matthew 28 uh beginning with the 16th verse and we've got the disciples this is after jesus um has ascended uh or before ascension but after he's risen from the dead um some worship some doubted but jesus said to them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me go Therefore, there's the commission, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Notice, not only this act of baptizing, but how? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So we practice baptism because Jesus instructed us to as the proper form of discipleship. Baptism is the originating uh, aspect of our life of faith. It inaugurates our relationship with God. So I wanna pivot to uh, where this comes into play uh, in our own practices at the church. So if you took one of the handouts uh, that were at the back, uh, you get the inside scoop of the secrets of what actually gets said up front uh, when a baptism is happening. Now, if you have a photographic memory uh, for the words that Tom uttered in his opening uh, uh, prayer and what's printed here, yes, there are some variations, you know, in terms of um, some of the languages of the prayers or what's offered as an introduction, uh, but generally uh, the sacrament of baptism uh, takes this particular form. And so as we walk through the liturgy together, uh, I'll point out some other uh, common um, and in important things to remember that are significant about um, the language that appears in what we say. So the opening word. And we notice that who opens uh, the, the sacrament? Who's the person that's speaking? The minister of the word and sacrament. We learn in the book of order that the baptism shall be, well, I'll skip that for a, session, for a second. Um, baptisms are administered by, and the, the word shall appears in the Book of Order. The Book of Order is the constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA. It's essentially our rule book. And so our rule book um, that is subordinate to the scriptures and to uh, the confessions uh, most of the time, I digress. But baptism shall, whenever you see a shell, you gotta do it that way. There's shall, there's may, there's should. A shall means you better do it this way. So baptism shall be blank, blank, blank. We'll get that to a sec in a second. And administered by a minister of the word and sacrament. Hence the title minister of the word and sacrament. That's another way of describing uh, pastors, uh, the ordained folk that wear the robes every Sunday and do the things. Uh, we are ministers of word and sacrament. So preaching and baptism and communion. Teaching elder is another euphemism, hence here. <laughs> I digress. Um, so we have a minister who opens uh, our time together uh, 
we introduce the one to be baptized. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show us that we belong to God. This, what I want to mention here, do, 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 do. The bond of unity in Jesus Christ. When we are baptized, we're made one with Christ, with one another, and with the church in every time and place. It's timeless. In Christ, barriers of race, status, and gender are overcome. We are called to seek reconciliation in the church and in the world in Jesus' name. What does baptism do? God, uh, in, through baptism, God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Christ. And by water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ. So the unity of the body of Christ and are joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. May it roll down like an ever mighty rolling stream. Let us remember with joy, remember, recall, uh, uh, the joy of our own baptisms as we celebrate this sacrament. Yes. Nancy, can you sit down on that point for just a second? Clearly 95% of us don't remember a single thing about our baptism. Right. Uh, what, why do we stress the remembrance? I mean, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but can you, can you address that? Yes. And, you know, I um, will uh, be glad to do a, a, a reflection uh, leaning into aspects of remembrance also for, join us for our second class on uh, communion, where remember is a huge chunk of the liturgy of what we do, of, the, of what we do in communion. This sense of remembering, there are a couple of ways that I like to think of it. I'll tease that for the second hand, for the second portion in communion. But essentially, um, it's not just an individual act of let's let's see if we can joggle your memory <laughs> and see if you can recall this see if see if everything was activated as you were an infant and couldn't even hold your own head up as to whether you can recall having water splashed on you it's it's a communal sense that we remember um what Christ has done for us through Christ's own act of baptism is that we remember through the act and the liturgy of the worship experience that we're having. Um, and we also just remember for the sake of the preservation of the history of the church. We remember that this uh, ritual act, this sacrament, is a part of how we are uh, incorporated into the body of Christ. So it's a, you know, never forget the flip side of never forget how important and how central this is. Does that help? Uh, yes, and yeah, uh, I'll take uh, these two uh, questions and then uh, we'll carry on here. Yes. Um, at the Davidson Presbyterian Church in North Carolina, yes. I happened to be there for a confirmation. Mm -hmm. And each of the confirmants came up and put their hands in the baptismal font in the water yes. as a remembrance of their baptism and then the recommittal. Yes. Yes. That's one. And I look forward to opportunities um, more in the future here at Fourth Church. Thank you for uh, lifting up that practice because um, it's, a, it's a beautiful practice that I've either led or experienced in a number of churches of fourth hasn't had that as a as, as a practice here so much but there are opportunities that we have to to do that to remember our baptism and to stand uh not as an actual jogger of memory but to be connected to that uh, knowledge that we have of what was done on our behalf just touching the water sometimes as the nice some churches use the little crystal pebbles that they hand to yes as as a remembrance of of baptism as well so it's it's that connection to holy institutional memory. And, um, you know, we do it in memory of Jesus, but also in discipleship with Jesus. So it's so that we never forget its importance. David, and then I'm, uh, we'll move along through our liturgy. I wrestled with that, remember your own baptism. I do, I was eight years old. Ah, yes. But I wrestled with that for a long time until 
I learned to insert the word of, to remember of your own baptism. Mm. And then the whole thing just becomes, oh yeah, I get it now. Mm. Now, what was it? Talk more about that. What did? What was the shift that that uh, so catalyzed? Remembering to me, remembering is yes, I remember something, but there's other things where it's I remember of, I remember of the importance of it, mm -hmm. but without my actually remembering the the exact details of it. It's mm -hmm. just like you might have a family event from a long time ago that mm -hmm. you remember of when your your brother fell off his bicycle or something like that. You don't remember the event, but it's certainly, it's part of the, the family history. And in mm -hmm. this case, baptism to me is part of the Christian family history of the way we do things. So yes. it becomes a remember of. Yes, absolutely. Yes, well put. Definitely. Hope that's helpful for, yeah, I think that's a beautiful way to frame it. Jaina, yes. I want to lift up a question from our online oh, friends. Oh, great. Thank you. So John asks, some suggest that baptism by the clergy is to be preferred, but any Christian can, could, and does baptize others. Please comment. It would be, as far as within the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, and I think that this is a technicality, uh, in, uh, a, a session can uh, allow for, can approve uh, an elder or a deacon uh, in the absence of a minister of the word and sacrament uh, to practice uh, baptism. Um, and there are also some, and I was going to fast forward a bit there, or get to that in a bit there, um, but where baptism is practiced in our tradition is always in community and almost, notice that caveat, almost exclusively in the life of the church. In recent years, there has been exception made in the Book of Order to allow for and, and to recognize um, some circumstances where baptism may need to be performed in other settings, such as in a hospital, um, uh, in a hospital. Uh, for example, let's say uh, a baby has been um, born ter facing ter terminally, you know, facing uh, end of life, you know, within hours. And sometimes um, uh, families wish to have baptism performed. And there are other circumstances. Prisons would be another place. You know, other other situations and contexts in which um, baptism uh, is an important um, practice to reaffirm for those involved uh, the circle of the body of Christ that supports them in pivotal moments. That's distinct from um, just sort of opting to um, go uh, to the lakeshore and uh, want to have a one-on-one -on -one and get dunked just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it used to be used to be a common um, candidate uh, ordination examination question. There's usually one about. John and Jane Doe just got married and they've just joined the church and they love the Jersey Shore. And, you know, and would, would, you know, this 4th of July weekend would love nothing more than just to gather in the early morning before all the beachgoers go out and be baptized. And they've extended an invitation to their pastor to come join them and, and do, do baptism for them. But if they can't, you know, if they don't have Sunday free, don't worry, we've got it, you know. Describe for us what the Book of Order might say about that. And that's when you've got to regurgitate the wrong, wrong, bad. You know. <laughs> but it's because um, of the centrality of the reaffirmation of the body of Christ among a particular worshiping community that makes vows, and I will fast forward this, um, makes vows, uh, the ruling elder uh, in the congregation 
as the congregation takes the whole responsibility for the nurture of those baptized in the faith. Tom emphasized that in his liturgy this morning about how we as the church in, in uh, the act of baptism make a commitment to this individual to nurture them into the faith and to help them as they grow live into the promises that have been made on their behalf. And um, we baptize infants, side note, uh, in our tradition. Some people may have grown up in traditions that don't baptize infants, that in fact think it's ungodly to baptize infants, that uh, avow um, a believer baptism. That is a knowledge and a confession uh, and, uh, of, uh, of sin and a profession of faith in Jesus Christ before one can consent to the act of being baptized. What Presbyterians believe is that the sovereignty of, of God over all um, extends through the grace that we recognize through the act of baptism that is present to everyone regardless of age, that it is present for the infant in as very real and just a way as it is for the 93-year-old who, as a 12-year-old, may have undergone dunking. So that's why, if, if anybody was wondering why we allow for and what's godly about that, that's why we practice infant baptism uh, as a part of our uh, tradition. Uh, one other point in who is responsible for how baptism happens. According to the Book of Order, baptism shall be authorized by the session. So it is the session's responsibility to make sure that the sacrament of baptism is uh, carried out with regularity in the life of the church. And it does all uh, within its power to support that happening, both in terms of taking care of the physical space, but also examining candidates for baptism, uh, be they the individuals themselves or the parents, uh, if it is uh, to be an infant who is baptized. Um, so we've affirmed uh, all of this. Um, a prayer is prayed of thanksgiving over the water. Uh, and again, we have these themes. Uh, I'll invite you, you know, on your own with the sheets to uh, uh, look through and recognize some of those themes that you remember as being important to emphasize. The power of water, uh, the connection with Jesus, uh, from his baptismal experience, the sense of death and resurrection, uh, the way that water is a part of our universal experience as a part of creation, uh, and of course, uh, the praise to God uh, through Jesus Christ and, and, uh, uh, and with the Holy Spirit. So maintaining that sense of the Trinity. You know, one fun thing that I'll point out related to how our liturgy came to be formed and what um, was the ancient antecedent for our language. Our practice of life and faith in, in the work of the church comes in large measure from a, an ancient document in the life of the early church uh, known as the Didache or the teaching of the 12 apostles. And here's what it had to say in chapter seven about baptism. Good thing you're seated. And concerning baptism, baptize this way. Having first said all these things, baptize into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in living, that meant running water at that time, baptize uh, in, in living water. But if you have no living water, baptize into other water. And if you cannot do so in cold water, do so in warm. But if you have neither, pour out water three times upon the head into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But before the baptism, let, let the baptizer fast and the baptized and whoever else can. But you shall order the baptized to fast one or two days before. So if we were doing this for real like the ancients, yeah, we'd be very hungry right now. Actually, we'd probably just broken our fast with cookies and coffee. But in order to enter into a sense of the purity of the spirit of this, we wouldn't have eaten. And neither would the baby. And neither would, neither would her parents. So um, 
that gives the sense of the, the ceremonial act of baptism and how it was prescribed in the ancient of days. Um, typically, baptism in our tradition is um, a response to the word proclaimed. And I've asked why we have our order of baptism earlier in the service than what is prescribed in the book of order or what customarily would happen. It would be after the preaching of the word, typically, because baptism would be a response, you know, to hearing the word proclaimed. Um, Tradition. That's the that's the, about the <laughs> as good a reason as as anybody's been able to offer so far. But if any of our um, uh, long in the tooth uh, members of Fourth Church uh, or companions with us uh, have uh, more uh, factual information related to that, uh, be glad to know. But essentially, you know, I think for ease of the parents being able to slip in and out is where we have it. But ordinarily, baptism. Uh, is uh, a response to the word proclaimed. C communion we preserve because communion is in response to the word proclaimed, and we do it that way as well. The offerings are also a response to the word proclaimed, so we do it after the word is preached. And so after all of that has been done, and in the ancient days, sometimes you'll see the symbol of baptism with a, a seashell, and often, you know, back in the ancient days, and there are some traditions that still use the seashell actually to, to do it, but that just represents sort of, you know, another aspect of nature and tying that to um, the liturgy. So we have the child presented and welcomed, joined and affirmed as a member of the Church Universal. Because membership, of course, they affirm once they're of age to undergo confirmation. But what we are affirming by calling them members in the body of Christ, the church universal. And so uh, then we close our final prayer, uh, again, invoking the Trinitarian formula of the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit being with us all. So in that spirit and being mindful of our time together, perhaps it's in that formulation of the grace of God, the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that I commend all of us and uh, give thanks to you for being a part of this experience of walking through baptism. Hopefully you'll be game and available to join us for round two next week as we dig into the Lord's Supper. Oh, well, that's very kind to say, but uh, thank you. Thank you. Any uh, parting? Okay, I turn it over to you, Ken. Well, Nancy, would you pray, pray us out? Yes, let us pray. God of power, might, majesty, love, and light, we give you thanks on this, your day, for the wonderful inbreaking of the Holy Spirit that you breathe into our lives. We give thanks for the gift of baptism, a holy mystery in which we wade in the waters of discipleship into the dying and rising with you. And may we reach out and find the hands of each other as we wade in these waters. May we rise refreshed and renewed to continue in our footsteps throughout the season of Lent, journeying to the cross and beyond. And we as God's people say, amen. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you.